Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy, and a lot of you out there probably knew this was coming as I kind of announced it in my Alco PA video. I've been looking for the longest time for a DNH Alco PA number 17 specifically. You can get models of the 18 and 19 from Atherin, 16 and 17 from Proto 2000, but after the 16 was introduced, uh, kind of a which was kind of a disaster when I got that one because I can't you can't really find the decoder for it anymore and it's difficult to get a standard DCC decoder in it. It's just a pain to work with. So anyway, after perusing inter the e internet and in particular eBay, I found this one for sale and bought it and brought it in and, des and uh, decided to do some work on it, of course. To start with, I should mention this unit does not have DCC or sound installed. It is the DCC ready variant and just shows to show you how hard these things are to come by. This is not new, it's used and Anyway, I went through a process of upgrading this to DCC and sound, but unfortunately I ran into a few bumps in the road. Anyway, let's get started here. As I pull the locomotive out of the package, we can see just how well packaged it is. It's nothing too, too fancy, typical Walters packaging, styrofoam, with of course the usual instructions you see me going through right there. Typical of what you get on these in this diagram, which would come in very handy with all the listings of parts, etc. I would, however, run into a few bumps with these parts, and one of them being the speaker. I'll get to more into that later. And let's get the actual locomotive out of the packaging itself. We note that the package actually has all the necessary packaging materials in it, including the cellophane sort of wrapping they put around the locomotive, showing that the engine was pretty well cared for in its previous life before I got hold of it. Next step now is to go ahead and disassemble the locomotive and see what's what. We'll start by removing the front coupler which to avoid of course damaging anything on the shell when we remove the shell itself. For this we just need a Phillips head screwdriver and a lot of patience and caution. After a few turns the coupler box itself is removed and we can then lift the shell right off. Now I'm not sure why, but the shell itself proved very troublesome to get off. It's not clear as whether there was some kind of internal work done at the factory that caused it to stick together, maybe excessive glue over spray, paint over spray, maybe something was just hung up, but it took quite a struggle and quite a bit of time to get the shell to separate from the chassis itself. Finally, after a good 10 or 15 minutes, I must say, of fiddling and actually removing the actual fuel tank itself, I finally managed to get the shell to separate fully from the chassis and get access to the internal components of the locomotive. Uh, with one minor hiccup, one of the side panels right there, as you see, came off. Not a big deal as it turns out to reattach, it just simply snaps back into place. And with the shell finally free and clear, we can take a good look at the locomotive itself internally. As you see, it has the standard 21-pin decoder set up as what these locomotives usually have. In this case, it's a dummy plug. There is a speaker's housing in the back, like all these locomotives. In this case, not populated by a speaker. And another annoying headache, as I mentioned with the speaker. If we take very, a very careful look at that speaker plug there, it is not actually a JTS plug. So... In, so in order to actually make this work, you're going to either have to A, find the plug this is and actually buy it from Walters directly, or B, do what I did, and I'll show that in a little bit. But before we get into that, a bit of good news, as we see that board in the front, which I've mentioned in my Alco PA documentary, is populated with both the Mars light and the standard headlight, which gets rid of the issue I was concerned about, which was having to get one of these boards if the engine didn't come with it from stock. Clearly, even though this is a DCC-ready engine, it comes with it, so it takes a huge weight off my shoulders. Next, we'll deal with the speaker or the lack of a speaker. Basically, the baffle is there, but there's no speaker inside. To get it off, we remove two screws, which are, again, Phillips heads, using the same screwdriver I had before. And once the baffle is off, we can then get a good look at the hole underneath it. The speaker size is 28 millimeters, which is a standard size for some of the locomotives. The QSI locomotives are 30 or like a 30 millimeter, so don't think you're going to use that one. I happen to actually have one for this particular locomotive, as it turns out, in my supplies. I bought a TCS speaker for one of the GE engines I was converting that, in the end, wound up taking a different size anyway, which I never, which I couldn't return anymore, so I went ahead and found that one, pulled it out, and put it in place. That would solve my issue with speaker for this locomotive. It, again, meets the specifications. Again, it has to be an 8-ohm style speaker to work with the Loke Sound, which is what I've decided to go with on this one. We'll be using a Loke Sound 5.0, and that's how I intend to get around the speaker issue, and I'll explain that.
And here is that low sound 5.0 I mentioned, and here's the secret or method to my madness. You see, the ESU 21 pin low sound 5.0, much like its predecessor, the 4.0, comes with these two brown auxiliary wires. And yes, they are in fact for a speaker. So this gives me a way of around that annoying headache that I've run into with a JTS plug that does not fit the standard speaker plug on the actual board, on the actual stock board itself for this locomotive. And so I unsoldered the wires that led to the JTS plug I had in intended to use before, and soldered in the wires that went directly onto the Luxound 5.0 decoder I'm using. Pretty simple, nothing much to this. Tin the wires, tin the speaker pad things, which were, uh, solder pad things, which are already tinned. And once I got the, all the wires in position, I then proceeded to mock everything up and make sure that all the wires were reached correctly through the speaker and all the way up to the decoder. I then went ahead and actually installed the 21 pin decoder itself. Please note again, you want to keep the black part of that decoder facing up, which is a mistake I almost made again here. I always catch myself on that these days. And make sure again that the wires aren't snagged on anything as they must flow straight back. If you kink the wires, you can destroy them. Also be careful here, because the pins literally are going to be pushing right where the wires are. This proved to be a really huge agony to get the speaker in place without ruining the wires that are hooked directly into the board without ripping them out. With the decoder now firmly seated, it was now time to work with the speaker baffle and the speaker itself, making sure that the wires were running as direct as possible to the speaker without getting kinked, and making sure that the speaker baffle itself did not kink them either, and making sure the whole assembly just made sense and worked. Next, I screwed the baffle down to secure everything into place so it wouldn't move around. Again, using the two screws that held the baffle down when I initially removed it to install the speaker. With the screws nice and tight, I carefully checked to make sure all the wires were in the correct position. Again, it is critical that the speaker baffle be tight to get the best sound out of the speaker as possible. Then I broke out my test track to go ahead and test the decoder to see if it would function correctly. Oh no, uh, uh, address number three rather. Let's see how this thing works. Okay, here we go, smoke test. No smoke, which is good. No sound, but that's common. I just have to now give it the address and it's F1 if I remember correctly to start this engine. Yep, there it goes. And that is essentially it. Slow up just to check to make sure. Oh, wait a minute. What's going on here? Whoa, 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 whoa. And as you can tell, yep, those were famous last words. Essentially, what as it turned out, what the problem was is that the rear truck was not actually hooked in to the actual drive shaft. Somehow or other, the drive shaft got separated. I'm starting to wonder if this is why the engine was put up for sale. But that wouldn't be the only problem I would run into with this locomotive. Anyway, with this new headache, the only way of fixing this annoyingly was to basically undo everything I did with the exception of the soldering, and essentially disassemble the locomotive circuit board and all to access the rear truck, which is mounted underneath the rear speaker, which is what I, of course, spent all this time putting in place. The reason for the need to remove the circuit board is to give me more room to access the shaft and be able to push the shaft back and forth, as this particular assembly is very tricky to work with. And as I carefully zoom this shot in, we can see exactly where the problem lies. There's the shaft, and if we look above, there is the flywheel, and as we see, they are not connected. Hence the reason why the engine wouldn't move, the rear truck wasn't actually turning, the wheels were locked, essentially, and the front truck was dragging the whole locomotive along by itself, which is not how things should be. Obviously, it would not function like that anyway, so obviously this is something I had to take care of. Luckily, it's not the hardest thing in the world to deal with. I also found upon closer inspection that the truck itself was actually not correctly mounted, so this required a little bit more aggressive work on this on my part. I had to physically pop the truck uh, or slash worm gear cover off to get the worm gear free in order to move the truck back so it would sit in the proper location. Once I completed this, and I'm sorry I don't have better footage, but my hand apparently got in the camera the whole time, I went and reassembled the entire assembly and got the locomotive ready for another test attempt. Okay, let's try this now, although I was considering using one of these anyway. Oop, there we go. Now I wonder if this thing... Aha! F3 actually kicks in the second light. It's kind of hard to see here, but F3 kicks in the Mars light, so it does work, but it doesn't do anything right now. It's not a Mars light, it just stays on consistently. We have to work on that. Please note that is not the proper sound effect for this engine, those of you who are going to point fingers. 
You'd be right to say that. No, it is not the correct sound effect for it. I like the hesitation I got there. I have dirty wheels. This contact track isn't the greatest either. And as you can probably guess, this locomotive wasn't through with me yet. I began to notice this hesitation continued to happen, even after swapping out one of my tra test track sections to see if that would do any enhancement. The locomotive still seemed to find a point to stumble right there, and it just didn't make any sense. And then, after a very unusual yet very effective test, I found out what the problem was. When I placed the front truck down on the tracks, the engine had power and ran perfectly fine. However, when I put the rear truck itself down on the tracks, as we'll see, the locomotive didn't actually have any power at all, which indicated that the problem was in the rear truck, again. In this case, it was a wire connecting one of the contact lines to the wheels themselves, which meant I would have to tear the engine apart yet again to actually fix this problem. So yeah, in a nutshell, it was not my night. So yet again, I popped off the rear worm gear cover to free the truck up so I could get the whole assembly out. Once I had access to it, I then proceeded to tear the truck itself apart to get to the disconnected wire. To do this, I simply popped off the two little snaps on either side of the truck and carefully removed the base plate itself. Finally, after what seemed like endless finagling and persuading, I managed to get the truck to come apart. One thing I could say for doing this, I could take, I could marvel at the enhanced drive system that Walters installed, the Hecular cut gears, and these unique bearings you see on the wheels that are circular in the side that actually makes contact with the wheel bearing itself, but rectangular in the area where they actually mount to keep them perfectly centered at all times. As you take a good look at this picture, we'll note that brown wire, that black wire in the background is not actually connected to anything, and that's the problem. There's a contact line that runs out to that wire that should be hooked up to something, and as we can see, it clearly isn't. And as we can see, here's the offending article. It's that contact line right there. There should be a wire hooked up to it, but as you can see here, it's not. So I had to break out my soldering iron yet again and go ahead and solder that wire, the black wire, back up to that point. Now, for some reason, the footage of this doesn't exist. I don't know what happened to it. So you'll have to just take my word for it that I did it, and it was quite a tedious mess. I think that's why I stopped videoing, because it was such a pain to get this done, as that contact line is really kind of squeezed into this very tight area in that truck itself. And if not perfectly assembled and perfectly soldered, it won't go in correctly. With the wire successfully reattached to the contact pickup, it was now time to reassemble the truck itself and get the locomotive back together and hopefully running again. I will note also, there was plenty of grease in this truck itself. I'm not sure if that's from the previous owner or from the factory. Whatever the case, I wasn't going to apply any to this unit. Since I didn't have a good foot, since I didn't have good or pretty much any footage of the locomotive being disassembled in terms of its truck, I'll go through that now. As you can see here, the trick is to line all the gears and the wheel assemblies up with the splines and make sure they go in. Make sure that the side with the gears on is on the bottom and the side without the gears on is on the top. In this case, that's the side that failed, which is the top piece. So as you see there, I'm just double checking to make sure all the gears are clear. This proved actually a very tedious process to get this truck back together and running smoothly. Remember, it's not good enough that this truck actually just simply goes back together. It has to move smoothly or you're going to have running issues. And as you can see, the contact line, which I had to actually pop out to make it solderable, now had to get popped back into place. And this is something that would cause me a little agita getting this thing back together. Finally, after several attempts, I finally managed to get the gear case and truck assembly back together and running smoothly. Once I confirmed that it would move smooth, I promptly began to screw, screw down the two screws to hold the truck together so I could then place it underneath the locomotive itself and put the whole locomotive back together for yet another test. Keep track of these screws a little bit better. <clears throat> the awkward position, but I can get that one in.
And now the truck is not going to fall apart on me, at least because I got the first one go. in. That's in. Okay, so that's assembled. Let's see if these wheels go in the way they should. Again, these are the rounded bearings. They should just slip right in. Oh, they got oh, they got blocks on them to square them off. So they got these sort of rounded bearings, but they're blocked off sideways. So they are squared, but they're not required. But they're rounded where it actually goes in. It's a very unusual concept that. Now, I wish I could tell you at this point that I finally made it to Easy Street with this locomotive and everything went smoothly from here on in. Oh, no, not with this model. The next headache I ran into, which I didn't film because it was so frustrating to fix, had to do with the wires themselves and how they actually had to go through the frame itself. As we see here, as I turn the locomotive frame around, they have this awkward shape that the lo that, that plug needs to navigate. It goes from it goes around a 90 degree angle inside the frame itself to where the pl plug protrudes and then wraps up to where the board is you see up there. In order to get it through, I literally had to hook a pair of pliers onto the front of that and pull it in. I actually, in the end, I think wound up using a pair of tweezers to get it and pull it in with a combination of that and a screwdriver. Another annoying headache of this is I was so over-focused in trying to get that wire through the frame, I completely forgot to keep track of the truck itself. I had not put the base plate on yet, and so the wheels essentially went flying everywhere, so I had to now put them back in place, re-square them, get the box to sit properly inside the bearing case areas on the truck itself so that they would run correctly. So that in short, this was not, in short, if I didn't say it before, I'll say it again. I think I did say it before. This was not an easy night for me at all. Now we have all the wheels in place. It's time to put the side frames on. This again is the same system as Atlas, as Ather, and Atlas does. Uh, basically, the side pieces have locks on them that lock in place, but they are further secured by the bottom plate. So, but you, so you have to get these pla these in place before you put the place the bottom plate on. Now here's that other thing. I've actually had to glue the uh, brake cylinder on. You can't tell it came out so nicely. Well, you can sort of tell this one's a little bit higher than the others. Oh, it's actually not very well attached. Uh, hmm. All right, I'm just going to have to deal with it, and if it falls off, it falls off. Okay, please stay on there. Luckily, there isn't any, luckily in this case, unlike the Atlas debacle I had more recently with that engine, that um, C420 where I broke the plates off, this one is just the dec decorative part that's uh, loose. Damn it, it doesn't have to actually hold any force, just to hold itself in place. Well, that's itself becoming a bit of a challenge, as it seems. There we go, that's in, that's in, push, 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 push. There we go. <laughs> I just had to figure out which way this truck goes on. All right, there it goes. It's this direction, matching the two clips up. Put the base place on. There we go, clip it in. Woohoo, and that's done, and it rolls. Not quite as smooth as I guess it is. Yeah, actually not too bad, so. Yeah, that'll do fine for what I want it for. Okay, so now I have to now put this whole assembly back together. I unfortunately managed to also knock the shaft out while I was doing all this stuff. So let's now carefully place the thing on top of this. Gonna thread the wires all the way through. Making sure not to lose them because I am not doing that again. Uh-uh, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, and I just gotta go... Oh, I hope I didn't just knock this thing off on the bottom. Be very careful to get this hole right in the middle. Where, 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 where? Come on, come on, come on. Where are you? It should slip right in. Every detail in this thing, I swear this thing is kicking and screaming. Though I'm beating it so far, let's hope I win it all the way, and that'll be if this thing runs, and I just have to then move on to program. There we go. Yes, it's in place. So now I'm going to turn it and actually place it on its trucks. Drive. Here's the worm gear shaft right here. That's now going to go in here. Let me see if I can turn this a little bit better for you. There we go. So now I'm going to feed this through here. To the motor area. Oh, I can make this happen, I think, without taking that out. Yeah, there we go. I got it in. So I do now is just slide it forward, and oh, there's a wire in place here. I don't want I to be very careful here. I think I can just let's put the truck out just enough to move this past it. Yes, there it is. Yes. Oh, I pulled that off. What happened is the wires were choking this, were trapped back here, so I had to now move that over. And I was able to pull it off somehow. Sorry for the awkward camera angles because this has been a pain to film. I'll probably have to do a summary shot, depending on how bad this is coming out, but I've just been focusing on trying to get the job done tonight. Okay, so, let's do this again. Pull the wire gently to get it up here, because I don't want this to lose slack. I don't want to break the wire either, so i got to sort of time it out carefully. Got to now let this thing drop onto the truck itself. Oh, God, almost lost the worm gear. Ah, there it is, that's in. Okay, that's in now. Now I take the worm gear, 
thread it into the truck and thread it into the motor itself. There it is, it's in. Sorry, I can't show a more detailed shot, but it's a very awkward one as is. There it is, that's in place. Now I take my worm gear cover, which I do have right back here, thank goodness, right here. <laughs> and I'm just going to clip that in place, and this should now hold the truck in place if all is well. Oh, wait a minute, it came out. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Don't want to put this in wrong, or I'm going to have to do it all over again. After all I did again, I'm not taking this apart again. <laughs> but yeah, this is not in quite right. So it doesn't feel like it's in right, but it appears to be. Hmm. All right, let's go ahead now and drop that in place. There it is. It's in. And will it will the wheels spin as the wheels spin? Okay. So as the wheels turn. <laughs> Does that turn? I don't want to grab it with a plier because I can offset it. It looks like that's good. Okay, let's give this a try again. I'm not going to assemble everything fully just yet. I'm just going to... Oh, i got to also plug in my front power truck. Here's the track power here. I'm just going to hook this into the track power connector right here. Come on, honey, right there. Yes, okay, it's in. Good, 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 good. Yes. Okay. Now tell me where did I put my... Oh, there it is. It's back there. So I have my speaker box, but I'm going to just test this first before I do anything else. Oh, my damn brake... Oh, the darn brake cylinder came off. All right, I'll have to re-glue that again. All right. So let us get the connection for this track up here. And let us power this on to see if it'll work. It's kind of tight. This is kind of a tight connection here. Let's get rid of that thing so it doesn't cause any problems whatsoever. Plug the wire in. Turn the power on. Okay, now I have to hit F1 again to get the sound. Oop! Sorry, folks. Didn't realize how, how you were hooked in there. Okay, gotta get my controller untangled. There we go. Now I can start it up. There it is again. Let's see if we make it move. Yes! Woohoo! Okay, that is awesome. Does it move smooth now? Yes! Okay, that was the problem. I disconnected the wire. It hesitates a little bit to slow down. It always does that. Yes, so I fixed the problem. The problem was a busted wire. Alrighty. I am very happy with that. So, let's now finish assembly. Let's run it the other way this time. Actually, no, this is actually the way I wanted to run it. Never mind. The power's on yet, so I don't need to worry about it. Uh, yeah. She just, this thing just looks beautiful, I gotta tell you. It looks even more eye-popping, in my opinion, than the Proto 2000 model that this thing replaces. And I always used to think of those as the best-looking ones. Okay, uh, at least in the DNH paint scheme. Okay, so let's try it again. Again, F1 is your power, because it's got the default sound on it. That is not... Again, that's not an outgo sound, it's a default sound. I'll change that later on once I'm ready to program, but right now I'm just testing. Uh, 
Thank goodness. Woohoo! <laughs> so I'm very happy with that. It works. I'll tell you something. I'll think twice before taking a truck apart on this thing. It's a job and a half, but it is doable. Okay, yeah. That works good. Okay. Terrible whistle. Oh, that sounds terrible. It's like an industrial critter locomotive. Anyway, well, sorry, folks. <laughs> That'll do it for tonight. Before I break anything else, I'm going to now just re-glue that cylinder on yet again and um, let it sit overnight, and then tomorrow I shall reprogram it. Anyway, folks, thank you for watching, and take care.